George, the fine tuning of the universe, the uh, necessity for the constants of physics and cosmology to be just so within very tight bounds in order for us to have galaxies and stars and planets and people uh, is a controversial one. And I would like to explore your views of the fine tuning of the universe from the work that you've done in, in cosmology and, and its implications. Okay, so there's no question that to get the universe we see today, a lot of things had to be in fair, fairly narrow range. There had to be this resonance in carbon in order for us to make carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and the heavier elements. There had to be a certain ratio, of the strengths of the weak and the electromagnetic and gravitational forces in order for there to be stable stars. And there's just, there's a whole long list of things. And so if you multiply the probabilities of each one of those things happening, you find the universe is exceedingly improbable. But if I said, what's the probability of getting someone with your exact genetic description? Well, take your genomes and multiply, you know, one in four, one fourth times the number of genomes in your particular sequence. It's extremely improbable that you as an individual or anyone in the audience as an individual exist. But if you take a whole sample of the world, there's a lot of people that exist, right? <laughs> right. And so it's the arguing from, you know, posterior statistics, right? It, after the fact, when you have something existing and say what the probability is, it's what you're taking for your, your prior is the, is the issue, right? What, what do you assume were the requirements that any possible value for all these parameters could exist and so forth? And so I find that a tricky thing to, to issue to discover and also not very powerful scientifically for investigating the universe. It's like, you know, saying, well, the world is the way it is because it is, right? <laughs> right. And so, I, I, think, I think it's fair to differentiate between two, two uh, ways of looking at fine tuning. One, as, a, uh, as part of science to then lead to further predictions, and the other is to reflect philosophically on what it may mean. And those are two different things. I mean, we could have no value in science, but deep matter, and philo deep right. meaning in philosophy, or no okay. meaning at all. Okay. So that's a tricky foundation to be on. So suppose you build your philosophical foundation based on the fact that all these probabilities are very low, and then I'm, I or someone else, it would be lucky if it would be me, that someone in science makes an advance and shows you that five of these things are totally correlated and have to be in the same ratio. And whammo, okay. Now. Knocks your probabilities way yeah, down. Yeah, knocks, make, brings your probabilities way sure. up and takes away the unimpending for, for your philosophical or belief system. Sure. That's, you know, should, do you want to build yourself on a foundation like that? So, the power of science is people are able to pursue and understand, and if the world teaches them something new, they have to adapt the system this, to do the, that. This to me is absolutely fascinating and really important because let, I, I want to define and describe this landscape in, in great detail. So if we have all of these parameters, however many you want, what are the options? The options are they all can be floating independently and then you have this probabilistic to multiply them all together. Or you can have some of them, or maybe some people hope all of them are derived from some fundamental theory that will force them all to be exactly the way they are. I mean, and, and, and would that affect your, your philosophy if you're basing the philosophy on that fine tuning? Yeah, right. And so, so let me give you an example. One of the motivations for string theory. The, the first one was to be a theory of everything. But one of the motivations that was very good about it is it had only one free parameter right. at the beginning. And the whole history of science has been, before we thought that, that there, were certain, there were many fundamental constants, and as we learned things better, we started getting rid of them. So one of them was we had a thing called temperature, we had a thing called energy, <laughs> and we had a Boltzmann constant in between, which was a fundamental constant. Now we know it's just the units of temperature Temperature is a form of energy too, and it's just getting the units from kelvins or centigrades to to joules or whatever unit you have to be using. And so the history of science has been, as we've understood these different branches of science, what look like fundamental constants have gone away and been units. Right. And string theory offered us the possibility of going to one fundamental parameter to describe everything, Very attractive, right. and it would everything would roll down from that. Now. Unfortunately, the physicists who, it, who thought it up at the beginning were pretty imaginative, but they failed to consult their, their friends in the math department who, who do geometry. And now we know that there are something like 10 to the 120th or 
10 to the 300th possible manifolds for the 11, yeah, a huge number. And so now the number of degrees of freedom is extraordinary. And you're back to saying, okay, well, we used to have this thing that says that, you know, a good, a good uh, statistician could, could, you know, fill an elephant with seven parameters and make his trunk roll with two more, right? <laughs> and so, you know, now you have, you know, 10 to the 500th possible parameters. You can describe the whole universe. And so now you're back to saying, okay, well, what caused that? Is it the fact that observers exist? And therefore, we tried all the possible parameters and the ones that led to observers are the ones we have to see, right? Because we have to be that way. By force. Uh, by, by just the fact that the, the, the universe had to realize observers in order to know itself, right? And so that's certainly a possible view. Um, I, my work up at this time has been to take the university see and describe it as well as we can. And that is, a, that is one of the things you have to do as a scientist. You have to say, what do I really see? What do I observe? Right, right. And what are the facts? And then you can't help but speculate what's the causes and the effects behind that. How does it really work? You know, what's the next level underneath there of, you know, the molecules moving around or the, what, what, what are the laws that really govern this? And that's the part we're talking about, right? You, you've moved from right, right, right. what we really see to what we think right. might be driving what we really see. And, and that's the part we're trying to understand and, and, and see. And so when you say it's fine tuned, you know it's fine tuned until you have a better idea of what's driving down to the system. What what ideas are we going to have revolutionary ideas about how space and time fit together? Are they going to automatically give us that, or do we really have a tremendous number, you know, ten to the very large number of bubbles of the universe out there, all with different parameters, and we have to be in the one that's most hospitable to our kind of life? And that becomes the anthropic principle, so-called, because we're human and therefore we we have to see this, and and that's the, and that's one kind of explanation of fine tuning. It's not the only one. Right. But I mean, it's sort of an argument, well, you know, where you must be on the top of a hill because there are telescopes here or something. Yeah, you know, right. and, and so Douglas Adam, uh, I expanded on, had this, had this sort of example. So there is on the Earth, you know, spaces, places where it rains regularly and a puddle during the rain season, the puddle collects. And in this puddle, there get to be microscopic bacteria and everything. And somehow they coalesce together and have thought, you know, they have a generic thought yeah. and the puddle, comes to consciousness and it wakes up and looks around and says, it's just amazing how the world was made for me. Look how it conforms to my shape, right? <laughs> because we know from the laws of physics, the water can do that, right? And it starts looking around and realizes many other things are special for its existence, right? And it's just going on about how fabulous how the world was created for it till it evaporates. Okay? And, and, you know, from our point of view, that's the anthropic argument, right? Right up to the evaporation. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, making arguments posteriori is much more difficult than a priori. It's much better to be in the situation where you put down a few rules and you let the universe unroll in front of you and you see what develops and see if it conforms to what you see than trying to take your idea that because you exist, the laws of science must be a certain way and extrapolate back. That's, that's a harder, direction to go it's it, but we try and do that by observations but by running the logic backwards is a is a trickier kind of a, a, a argument to make